Anyhow, so we want to go ahead and get started today. Tommy says we're online, so let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, God, today for this opportunity once again to be in this place. We thank you, Lord, for this place. We're so grateful, God, uh, that you have provided us with this wonderful facility. And we continue, Lord, to offer you praise and thanksgiving. We continue, God, to be grateful for that which you have provided. And, Lord, we thank you so much uh, for the good news that we've received this week, the blessing uh, that you have bestowed upon us and the blessings that you continue to bestow. Master, tonight we ask that your anointing would be present in this Bible study. Let everything that is said and done be to your glory. Let everything, God, that we offer today lift up the name of Jesus. Anoint the mouth, O oh God, of the speaker, the teacher. Anoint the ear of the hearer. That we might receive tonight from the Holy Ghost that which you would desire to speak unto your people. Grant it, O oh God, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I have started tonight off on the uh, slide from last week. We, we began last week looking at the uh, subheading, Listening and Doing, verses 19 through 27. And last week we talked about, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which, <coughs> which is able to save your souls. I pointed to the fact that this passage, which frequently is pointed to and used uh, to try to dictate, quote-unquote, Christian conduct or Christian behavior, you know, this is how Christians, we're not, we're supposed to be slow to speak and, or, you know, we're supposed to listen and not talk and blah, blah, blah. And this passage is not talking about that. This passage is talking about how we as believers deal with and respond to the Word of God. And uh, the reason I wanted to just recap this little passage real fast is because the very next verse begins with, but, which means it's building off of this. And I told you last week, the fact that this particular section, uh, verse 21 uh, tells us, Receive with meekness the engrafted word. So this is part of what points us to the fact that this is speaking of our response to the word of God. Amen. Then the, the passage that follows, verses 22 through 25, also of course, chapter 1 of James, it starts out by saying, but, so it's uh -huh. building on, uh -huh. but, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. So you see, this whole portion is speaking expressly, not how we ought to treat outsiders, not how we ought to behave toward folks, you know, one another. No, this is speaking of how we ought to deal with and respond to the word of God. Amen. Be slow to speak. Quick to listen. This is not talking about how you deal with one another. It's talking about how we deal with the Word of God. Don't let your anger, don't let your wrath, don't let your emotions get involved and cloud your response to the Word of God. More people lose out with God. More people wind up backslid. More people wind up leaving churches in a huff. Because they do not obey this mandate in James 1. They do not approach the Word of God the way James says to approach it. And so tonight it is so important that we understand the proper context that James is speak in which James is speaking. He said, but be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only 
deceiving your own selves. <coughs> my word, that's a powerful statement. You know, my mother was talking to me the other day on the phone and she said, when you preached that message a couple of weeks ago, faith is not an option. She said, man, I've never heard that. I've never heard that. And boy, that just knocked me right between the eyes and made me realize that I've got to step up. I've got to be a person of faith. I've got to start trusting God. I have to because faith is not an option. And she said, and you know what? It is amazing. It is utterly amazing how easy it is now when things happen that would normally upset me and have me all flustered. She's, it's amazing how quickly I'm able to say, well, you know what? It's in God's hands. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to let it fluster me. You see? You must be a hearer. I can get up here and preach the Word of God all day and all night and all day and all night. And if you leave this building and don't do what you've heard, then you're wasting your time and mine. And, according to James, you're deceiving yourself. That's powerful. That's powerful. There are a lot of people in the church world today... I could think of some that have been through our church in the last couple of years who fancy themselves these great, wonderful Christians. But man, when it comes to living the Word of God, they don't do that. Not by a million miles. And honey, according to James chapter 1, they're deceived. They're deceived. There are people out there that they think they're saved and they're not. There are people out there today who think they're going to heaven and they're not. There are people out there today who call themselves Christians and honey, they're not. They are allowing a spirit of deception to overwhelm their soul because they, they listen but they don't do. They hear but they don't put it into action. They don't put it into practice. I can go down a list of so many principles of God's Word that commonly are ignored. My Bible tells me we're supposed to submit ourselves to those that the Lord puts over us. Am I telling the truth? Yes, you are. When I've had pastors and I've asked my pastors for advice and counsel on something, let me tell you something. Whatever they told me, whether I liked it or didn't like it, I did it because according to the Word of God, I'm supposed to submit myself to them. God's placed them there for a reason. I'm going to tell you something. There, there are so many times when the preacher can be a great benefit to people because I'm not emotionally caught up in your situation like you are. And I'm an external third party that doesn't have all the emotional entanglements that you have in any given situation. And therefore, when you ask me, what do you think I should do about this situation, this relationship, this this, or this move, or this, I can give you an honest, factual, biblical answer with, uh, because I don't, I'm not invested in the situation. And that's a good thing. Yes. That's a good thing. Because it's that emotional investment that will make you do the wrong thing every time. Amen. And when the preacher offers you advice and counsel, instead of bucking it and fighting it and arguing with it and running off and crabbing and complaining, you know, if we would do what God's told us to do, we'd be so much the better for it. We'd be so much the better for it. I, I'm going to tell you, I have never one time in my entire ministry offered counsel or advice to anybody because I was looking to destroy them. <laughs> I don't remember one time ever somebody coming to me and asking me for counsel and I said in myself, ooh, let me, here's an opportunity for me to just tear this person's life to shreds. That thought has never gone through my head. 
And if you attend our church and you think for one minute, that's how I think, then you really need to, to help do yourself a favor. Go find you another church where you think the pastor has your well-being in mind. Because obviously you don't think I do. Hello now. And if you don't think the pastor's got your well-being in mind, then you're in the wrong church. It's that easy. Because I'm not going to attend a church and place myself under a pastor. First of all, you shouldn't do anything except that you feel led and directed of the Lord, number one. You shouldn't be in a church unless you feel like a... I remember moving into a community years back in East Texas. I still identified as Trinitarian at that time. And before I ever visited a church in the city that I moved into, the Lord spoke to me and told me to go to this apostolic church. He said, that's where I want you to go. I never even visited it. Had never gone there not one time. And the Lord said, that's where I want you to go. So guess where I went? And I'm going to tell you that pastor, many times I was young. And, and boy, I'm telling you, I look back and I realize just how off the mark I was in my youth. You know, I, I thought I was living this thing so good. God help us. And that pastor many times said things to me. Because I was not where I ought to have been and wasn't doing what I ought to have been doing as much as I thought I was. And God told me to go there. If God put me there, then honey, I have no business bucking the authority of the pastor. I have no business bucking his counsel. I have no business. Why? Because the word of God tells me to. Submit myself to those that are over me in the Lord. Now, you can sit here and play games all you want to, but if you don't do what the book says, you're deceiving yourself. And that's just one area. I know people go to church and they think they can hate somebody in the church. They think they can hate somebody else in there. I hate that person. I can't stand that person. I just, I wish that person just quit coming to church. And my Bible tells me, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have loved one to another. Honey, it's time to be praying that God somehow can help you find love for that individual. You are not justified in having a bad spirit and a bad attitude about them. You can try to justify yourself all you want to. You are not justified. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. I said ages ago, I've been saying for the last several months, Prophetically. See, a lot of people, Jack, they do not understand the nature of a prophetic ministry. If not everybody can handle a prophetic ministry. That's the truth. Many preachers in the pulpits today uh, are so far from being a prophetic voice for the Lord, it's not even funny. I received a, uh, I've been in communication with an a apostolic man out in Washington State. He's wanting to affiliate himself with our ministry. He's planning on coming down and visiting us next month. He invited a, a man within the affirming movement to come out there and preach for him. And the man came, and while he was there, I'm going to say it plainly, slept with three different people. And this man said, when he left, when this visiting preacher left, he said, I had a mess to deal with. I had a real mess. 
to deal with. And he said, I've been praying and fasting and asking the Lord, and the Lord pointed me to you. Because we don't just talk the game, we don't just talk the talk, we genuinely do everything in our power to walk the walk. And uh, so he wants to align himself with us, and we're happy to help anybody that wants to engage in apostolic ministry in the GLBT communities, provided they want to live right, walk right, and do right. Amen. If you have a mind to play the game, honey, there's all kinds of little groups you can belong to. This is not one of them. But you see, folks, uh, there are those out there, even in pulpits, who are deceiving themselves. book says one thing, they're doing something different. And uh, you can justify yourself every which way you want to, but God help you when you stand before the Lord in the judgment. There will be no justification. You will not stand before God. And uh, I frankly, I'm going to be honest with you. This, this has been my thought for I don't know how long. Many, many, many years. I believe people that live one thing, they read, they read and they hear the Word of God and they do something different. I believe there's a very simple explanation for that, and that is in their heart of hearts, they do not believe God is real. I'm convinced of that. I'm utterly convinced of that. Because if in your heart of hearts, you genuinely believe God is real, that's what we call fear of the Lord. There is no way in the world you would gamble eternity. There is no way in the world you would gamble your soul by playing games with God, hearing one thing and doing another. Hello now. There is no way in the world. I can't do it. I can't do it. God is real to me. I believe there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. I believe that hell's hot and heaven's real. And I cannot for the life of me be comfortable playing games with God. I just can't do it. Can't do it. And thank God I can't. Because deception is a powerful demon. I'm going to get into spiritual warfare for a minute. You sell yourself out to a spirit of deception, honey, and I've got news for you. You will be under its spell, and you'll find yourself at the time of your death sliding into hell on grease skids and screaming and hollering because you allowed a spirit of deception to dictate what you believed about yourself and your walk with God. And a spirit of deception is a powerful, powerful demon spirit. People that are involved in cults fall under the influence of a spirit of deception. And it is a terrible, powerful spirit to break in their life unless they come to the place where God has somehow helped them to see that they are deceived and they're willing to let it go. But if they are not willing to let go, then, sweetheart, you're not going to tear it up out of their hands. There's, there's no way in the world. There, there's, in the spirit world, there are very, very powerful spirits like witchcraft and the occult. These are some of your more powerful spirits. Uh, the spirit of lust is an incredibly powerful spirit. Uh, and then the spirit of deception is right up there. It's right up there. The Word of God tells us that in the last days, God said uh, that He would turn some over to a reprobate mind that they might believe a lie. Let me paraphrase that for you. He will allow a spirit of deception to overwhelm you and overcome you. He will allow it to take uh, charge of your life and convince you of a lie. 
You see, those that are full of the Holy Ghost and fear God, we're shielded from a spirit of deception. I mean to tell you, the Holy Ghost lets you know in a flat minute when somebody telling you something that ain't so and isn't right. Amen. But when you are wanting to play games with God, when you want to hear the Word, you know, and God help the preachers who want to preach, quote unquote, the Word, and then turn around and do the exact opposite. One of the things that makes me laugh is the organizations in the GOBT community for, that claim to be Pentecostal. In their statement of faith, uh, they make a big fuss about how monogamy is God's plan. Oh, they make, they're trying so hard, brother, to impress the mainstream with their words on the paper. Uh -huh. And yet, the majority of these fools are not even living up to what they say they stand for. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. I told this man when he contacted me, I said, well, I went and preached for one church, and as the pastor was giving me a ride to the airport, he asked me, how come I didn't try to get with any of his members? Didn't I find any of them attractive? The pastor asked me this. I said, brother, that's not what I'm here for. I didn't come to play games. I didn't come for sexual conquests. I didn't come for uh, some sort of a tryst. I'm in a relationship. I've been in a relationship. I said, I, that's, that is not even close what I come here for. And isn't it funny that I don't get invited back? Oh, they shout and they carry on, Jack. And people wonder why I have approached things so differently in this church. People wonder why I don't put all the emphasis on the shout and on the dance and why I don't put all the emphasis on let's just carry on and act this way and do like this. No, I have spent the last 19 years in the GLBT movement preaching and teaching that which would create roots and cause depth of experience. Not just create the outward external appearance of a walk with God, but a message that genuinely would help people to find a real, honest walk with God. And I've seen the evolution in this church, 10 years, I've seen the evolution in this church. I see how God now is kind of leading us in, a, in kind of a new direction and it's building on. But I see that the foundation's been laid. It's a, it's a foundation of you better live this thing, just don't talk it. Amen. You better live this thing, just don't, just don't act it out. That foundation's been laid, and now we're moving on to bigger and better things, and the Lord's leading us up higher. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. How many times you look in the mirror and you fix your hair and you straighten your tie and two minutes later you can't even remember what you look like in the mirror. Uh -huh. Mirrors are funny. There, there's no residual effect for a mirror. In other words, the mirror only works so long as you're standing in front of it and looking into it. Mm -hmm. The minute you walk away from it, 
you're not still seeing your image. No, the mirror only works when you're standing right there in front of it. And what James says is, those who are not doers of the word, but hearers only, he said they're like people that look in the mirror, walk away, and they've done forgot the minute they walk away. They've done forgotten already what they look like. They've already, it's as if when the Word of God is staring them in the face, it's only then that that Word has any power in their life. It's only then that they have any inclination to really look at it and investigate it. But the minute they walk away from it, then all memory of it just goes right down the drain. My Lord, have mercy. Good teaching. How many people come to church and, oh, bless God, I feel conviction. Oh, bless God, I feel the Lord speaking to my heart. I feel the Lord really pressing up on me. And yet we walk out the door, and the minute we get out the door, why do you think at the end of just about every message I preach when I close in prayer, I say, Lord, help us to take this message with us. Don't I say that? Yes, you do. Say, Lord, let this message be part of us as we leave this place. Let us meditate on it. Let us think about it, Lord. Help us to be reminded of the principles and the lessons that we've heard tonight in this message. Because if only, it's if all you're going to do is see it here and now and walk away and forget it, then I have spent however long preaching for nothing. Uh -huh. It's worthless. One of the greatest thrills in my life when I pastored my first church. I was just a kid. And one of the things that tickled me so much that I had never seen before. So, and, I, and I'd been in church my whole life. But I never saw people do like my church folks did in my first church. And uh, Sue would come up to me. Or Leo would come up to me or June would come up to me and say, Pastor, remember when you preached blah, blah, blah six months ago and they would call the message by title. Uh -huh. And people did this all the time. And they'd say, you know, I'll never forget when you preached living by faith. I'll never forget when you preached Faith is not an option like my mother just did. See, I hear that in this church too. I hear people come back later and say, Brother, when you preach this message by this title, boy, there was, there was a lesson in that. There was something in that, a truth in that, that I walked away just nibbling on for the whole week to come. And even now, I've still got a piece of it stuck in my tooth. And that thrills me. It thrills me that I can get in the pulpit and preach the word of God and that it is not forgotten the moment you walk out the door. Uh -huh. But that it rests in your spirit. It rides in your heart as you leave this place. And it begins to just echo in your mind and in your heart. Until finally it begins to manifest itself in the way you do things and what you say and what you do and how you do it. Hallelujah. It's one of the greatest compliments that any preacher can ever receive. And James said there are those that just like looking in a mirror and the minute they walk away, there's absolutely no clear remembrance of what they've just seen whatsoever. How many times have you seen somebody look in a mirror and then not even a minute later they're back in front of that same exact mirror? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Because the memory is that fast. I've always said, I'm going to say this, I've always said that the memory associated with intimacy is the same way. That's why once you've gotten where you're trying to go in an intimate moment, once you've gotten there, it's almost as if you've never done it. Because the whole 
pleasure in the experience is in the working up and the building up and, and arriving, I'm going to say. And once you've done that, it's like all of a sudden, it's so anticlimactic, boom, right down to the basement you go. And that elevator has to go back up again at some later date because, honey, as soon as it's finished, you forget all about it. I don't know very many people that have an experience intimately and they go for a month and say, oh, I don't need it for a month now after what I just had. Hello now. Woo! That person put it on me till I don't need it again for a year. It don't happen that way. The memory is short-lived. This is how people are with the Word of God. This is how folks are. Many people, their memory, yeah, in church, boy, they feel it. In church, yeah, they're, they're in it. They, they feel the anointing. They feel the power of God. They feel conviction. But brother, when it's all over, it's as if they've never done nothing. That's what troubles me about people. I see some people leave church and Jack and I will be walking on air and, and I know we're going to be feeling it for the next five, six days. And I see others, we go out to eat after church and brother, they've already done worn out. They're over it. As good as it was, well, it's over now. It's only that good when it's happening. No, that's not how it ought to be. That's not how it ought to be. And as I have said last week when we were talking uh, about being uh, slow to speak, quick to listen, so on and so forth, and I talked about the fact that uh, it has to do with the attitude with which we approach it. If you come into the house of God with a mindset to hear from heaven and to receive from the Lord, then honey, I got news for you. When you leave this place, you will not leave with this sensation of, okay, that's over. Mm -hmm. That's finished for me. No. That anointing and that power and that presence of God in that message will just ride with you for days and days and days to come. I've preached messages that the anointing on that message, even as the preacher, I, I still haven't forgotten, and it's been years. Mm -hmm. The substance of the message. You notice we were at Hunkies for Fellowship a couple weeks ago, and somebody came in, and somebody asked him, did you see Bible study on the Internet? Oh, yeah, I watched it. Wasn't that good? Of course, we're talking about the content. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the message. We're talking about the teaching, the quality of the teaching. And what does this person do? Oh, yeah, boy, the preacher really got worked up. Oh, boy, he was sure excited. Huh? What? Mm -hmm. All you're paying attention to is how excited the preacher gets when he delivers the word. All you're paying attention to is the passion, the emotion. And you're telling me for all that hearing, you don't appreciate the quality of what was offered? Because, honey, that's what stood out to me. Uh -huh. Amen. My Lord have mercy. But see, this is how shallow, this is how less than spiritual so many people are. It's all about the shout. It's all about the dance. And when it's all over, they'll be looking to get to another church next week that they can shout and scream and carry on in. But that whole week in between, their life hadn't changed a lick. My mother said to me, we were on the phone, and I told her, I said, I believe we're going to start to see church growth very soon. And she said, well, I just pray God sends 
The right kind of people. I said, he will. You know why? Because the wrong kind of people don't stick to this church. People that want to play the game, honey, they visit, but they don't come back. That's a good thing. That's right. And I say good riddance. We're not trying. Listen, you know, Jack, it kills me how some people will say, I don't like the way you approach things. I've never known a pastor does things the way you do them. Really? Well, let me tell you why. Because I'm not trying to accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. That's right. I'm not trying to achieve what they're trying to achieve. I'm not trying to get where they're trying to go. My objective is entirely different. Uh -huh. My goal is entirely different. My vision is entirely different. So therefore, if you think I'm going to do things like every other preacher does, you're out of your mind. Because I'm not even trying to go where they're trying to go. I'm trying to go somewhere very different. Amen. But you know what cracks me up? We've been in Dallas alone for 10 years. I spent nearly that long elsewhere in other cities preaching this message. I've never seen anybody come to our church who left and their life was worse off for having been here. Uh -huh. I've never seen anybody come into this church whose life was worse off for being here. Uh -huh. I have seen person after person after person and couple after couple after couple come into this church and I have seen the truths of faith. I have seen the truth of one God in Christ and Jesus is His name and baptism in Jesus' name and the gift of the Holy Ghost. I have seen these things ignite in their spirit something that caused them to suddenly begin to experience blessing. Uh -huh. I have never in my life seen God bless people like I've seen God bless people in this church. Uh -huh. Amen. There is not a soul that has walked into this building in the last 10 years. Not a soul that became a part of this church for any period of time except that their life began to experience blessing from yes. God and it began to pour out on them and all of a sudden jobs opened up for them. Uh -huh. Promotions opened up for them. Uh -huh. Housing opened up for them. Vehicles opened up for them. Uh -huh. We've seen God bless like, I, like I, I was thinking to myself just the other day. I thought, you know what? Honest to God, if there was some way for people out there see. to see the way God moves when people start coming to this church, honey, we'd have people jumping on airplanes and moving to Dallas to be part of this church uh -huh. because I have never seen anything like it in my life. Amen. If you don't like the way this preacher does things, if you don't like the way this preacher approaches things, well then honey, God bless you because apparently he does. And his opinion is the only opinion that I value. His opinion is the only opinion that's important to me. That's the truth. God put somebody in my life almost 15 years ago to support the work that I'm doing financially. When it would almost look like we'd have to shut down and we wouldn't be able to keep going. There's this one individual, very well-to-do, very successful and well-to-do, and this individual began 15 years ago to support the work that I'm doing. And he still does. Praise the Lord. And I get a call this week. Brother, are you sitting down? I said, well, I am, but do I need to be? He said, you, you might need to be. And I said, uh-oh, because... I had just gotten word of a friend's death, you know, a few days ago, and I was afraid maybe it was more bad news, you know. And so I have this little phrase I use when I'm kind of hoping it's not bad news and it's good news. I say, well, what's the good word? 
He said, well, the good word is, I can't give you all the details because he asked me not to. But the good word is, within the next few weeks or so, the one church is going to get a check for more than $13,000. Hallelujah Woo! to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. That's the good word. Thank you, Jesus. He said, I've, I've got to do some things with my finances. I've got to rearrange things a little bit. And that requires that I take a certain amount of money out of an account in order to, I guess, for tax, you know, whatever. Anyway, he said, and I made up my mind that however much I've got to take out of that is going to you this year. Ooh, praise the Lord. Oh, but I'm not done. This person is 70 years old, retired a few years back. Been supporting this work. My ministry, me. Wherever I've been, Atlanta, Connecticut, New York, Texas, doesn't matter, wherever I go, he's supported whatever I'm doing. He's not even Pentecostal. And he told me on the phone, he said, after our friend died, this man that I've known for so long, and he also, matter of fact, it was kind of through this man that this man and I met and became friends. He said, after this individual died, it made me realize that I've got to get all my affairs in order, get my will up to date and everything. And he said, so I'm going to be doing that this week. He said, I just want you to know that your church is my primary benefactor. He said, when it's my time to go home, the money I got in the bank is going to y'all. This man has shared with me over the years because he's a friend. I, I count him as a dear friend as well as a supporter. He's told me over the years about his investments and about his banking. And, you know, he, he's very open, you know, tells me. Because he's been so supportive for so many years. I'm not going to tell you the figure. But folks, it is in way in the six figures. He said, and I made up my mind, that your church will get that when I'm gone. Yeah, this preacher don't know how to do it, Tommy. This preacher don't know how to preach it true. This preacher don't know how to lead God's people. This people don't know how to. This preacher don't know how to do it right, Jack. Oh no, we got people that let you know in a hurry that oh, God don't use him. Why like, he just a cult leader? He just this. He just that. But isn't it funny? I don't know very many churches that are blessed. The way this church is blessed. I don't know very many preachers that are blessed the way this church, this preacher is blessed. I have never in my life experienced what I have experienced in the way of support uh, from somebody like this. I've never experienced it in all my years. And I thought to myself, see, I kept jumping the gun when it come to wanting to build the ark, you know, the, the thrift shop and the bookstore. The Lord said, the day's coming and you'll be able to do every bit of it and you'll be able to do it all first class right off the starting line, baby. You'll be able to do it all. We'll be able to build a church building. Be able to do everything you've envisioned doing. God's already lined it up. He's already set it up. Oh, but there are people who don't like this preacher's approach. No, if people want to act like faithless, fearful, whatever, this preacher says, go to another church, please. See, that I don't try to just fill the pew for the sake of having a full pew. No, my desire is 
have a church full of people that are of one mind and one accord because I want to see Pentecost all over again. I want to see people that are all sharing the vision. I want to see people that all have a desire to experience the same thing. And if somebody comes in that just don't want to get on board and just wants to sit around and be negative Nelly and down-mouthed and fearful, and blah, blah, then honey, you know what? There's a dozen affirming churches in Dallas that will be happy to have you. This is not one of them. I'm not interested in people that want to hear the word and not do it. I want people that want to hear it and live it. Because I know what God can do when you have people who don't just hear it, but put it into practice. James continues in verse 25, he said, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. Oh, he said, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We've seen that in this place. We've seen that in this place. We see it every day. We see it in the preacher. We see it in the pew. We see it in the members. We see God blessing people who are merely listening and forgetting when they walk out the door. But they're doing what they hear. Hallelujah. And they are blessed for it. Yes, we are. My Lord have mercy. Woo. There's a reason why we're getting phone calls that start out with, are you sitting down? <laughs> There's a reason. You want to be blessed in all you do, then do all that you hear. Hallelujah to God. It's that easy. Do it. Do it. Don't just listen. Don't just hear it. Do it. Start living this thing. My God have mercy. I'm telling you, Jack, you've seen it. You've seen people come into this church, and I mean, they come in but broke and struggling just to put grocery on the table. And they will make the sacrifice to tithe. And next thing you know, the job is given a promotion. Somebody call them up on the phone and hands them a job that they haven't even applied for. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm telling you folks, it works. Yes. If you don't like the way this preacher operates, I got news for you. You're, you're, there's something wrong with you because it works. I preach faith, it works. Uh -huh. I preach holiness, it works. Uh -huh. I preach obedience, it works. It I preach sanctification, it works. Uh -huh. My Lord, have mercy. I preach action, not words, it works. Amen. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. How many people in the church world today, boy, they just hate the word works. Yep. Because they're ignorant and they don't understand that the term that is used in the King James work or works is not always speaking of the same thing. The works of the law are one thing. The works of the flesh are another. The works of God meaning doing that which is in obedience to the word of God is something different. And you are not saved without works. That's right. You are not saved without works. You are saved according to the word of God without the works of the law. Uh-huh. But you are not saved without action in response to your faith. Uh -huh. 
Uh -huh. Prescribed by God. That's right. That's why we baptize in Jesus' name. Because uh -huh. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Uh-huh. And we're going to talk about it probably next week or so. James chapter 2, faith without works, without action is dead. Being alone. Uh -huh. but I don't want to get ahead of myself. <laughs> he said, but he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. You do the works that are mandated by the Word of God. This man shall be blessed in his deed. You don't have to like the way this preacher preaches. You don't have to like the way this preacher teaches. You don't have to like the way I do things. Honey, you, ain't, you can dislike it all you want to. The blessing just keeps flowing up on our heads. Uh -huh. So dislike it all you want to. The proof is in the pudding. Uh-huh. Right. My Lord have mercy. <laughs> I'm going to try to finish chapter 1 today, okay? So we'll, we started a little late. We're going to go just a little bit longer to try to finish. James continues in verse 26, chapter 1. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord have mercy, could I run with this? I keep talking about the fact we've had people come to our church, get mad at the preacher because he said, it's a dumb idea to move in with somebody after you only know them a very short while. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden, because that person was mad at that word of advice, all of a sudden, they're out there running around telling people, oh, he's just a cult leader. Why, that church is just a cult. Blah, 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 blah. I got news for you, honey. You're deceiving your own self. Your tongue is a viper and a deadly snake. It is a demonic thing. And the only person who's convinced that you're a child of God is you. You're not fooling God. Because anybody who claims to be religious and can't bridle their tongue. I'm going to tell you, I attended a church many years ago when I was in the church of God. I was at Riverside, and I loved Riverside. Loved Y'all know how much I loved Riverside. I talk about it all the time. Loved Riverside. But I went to Brother Gillum, and I offered myself to him and said, Brother, can I help with children's church? Can I help with Sunday school? Can I do something? in the church and he said Chuck honestly son we are an old church we've got so many workers and which is a wonderful thing to have when uh -huh. have a church got so many workers he said really at the moment there's no need I, there's nowhere I can put you there's no need anywhere well I talked to sister Bruce who was kind of like an adopted mom to me and I told her, I said, I, I love this church more than I love anything, but I can't just go to church. I've got to work for Jesus. I've got to do something. She said, well, honey, there's a pastor in South Fort Worth who has gone into a church that had gone on administrative uh, hold. In other words, they basically closed the church. They had the building, but it was closed. And the church got on the property. And this man came along and he said, uh, I want to go and restart this work. So he went to South Fort Worth and he had restarted this work. And uh, she said, why don't you contact him? She said, I'm sure he needs workers. And maybe you can go help him. And that sounded good. Now listen, I love Riverside. I could have stayed at Riverside and shouted. I could have stayed at Riverside and had me a Holy Ghost Jubilee every Sunday. But I couldn't do that and not be working for the Lord. Oh, I, boy, could I go off on a lesson here about people who won't deny themselves anything to work for God.
If they can have a happy little life and just sit on the pew and do nothing for God but shout and have a good time, that's what they'll choose. I couldn't do it. I went to Brother Gillum and I told him and he said, Son, I understand. I understand. So I went to the pastor of this other church and I talked to him. And I won't go into gross story detail, but he said some things that really hit me strange. He, he said some really strange things in our very first meeting. Talking about how he demands loyalty from anybody that comes into his church. I've never heard a pastor talking about demanding loyalty. You know, I, it just, I don't know, it just something hit me wrong. But to make a long story short, I still went. Even though in my spirit something, I knew something wasn't right. I still went. And he invited me to stay in his home because I was just at the time 16, 17. Just turned, uh, yeah, I was a little over 17. And he invited me to come stay with he and his wife, and they had two sons. And I got along terrific with his two sons, and because I've always loved kids, you know. And I got along great with the kids, and they were, they were like maybe nine and seven or somewhere around that age. And he also had a young lady living in his home from the church who needed a place to live. And she used to run around the house all the time in silk shorts and nylons. These little cut-off shirts. Good-looking girl. Had quite a figure on her. And not to be mean, but she looked like a little hooker. She absolutely looked like a little hooker. Next thing I know, I began to see that this man was giving her cigarettes and other things. And I began to be exposed to some other things. And to make a long story short, I found out that this man was having sexual relations with several of the women in the congregation. Not to mention this young girl. He's letting her smoke and drink because he's getting something up out of the bargain. One of the church members come to me one day in private. This man had people in his church, honey. They were like hawks. Everybody was watching everybody else, just like the Jehovah's. Everybody was watching everybody else. Make sure... None of this got out, what was going on. And this lady came to me secretly, privately. Real sweet lady named Sister Patsy. And this man had established a Christian school at his church. And everybody in the church was encouraged to put their kids in this school. And this man was buying houses all around the church the church is up on a hill and all the houses on the street going down from the church from down to the main street he's buying up all these houses and then he rents them out to church members to make a long story short this guy would get people in his church so beholden to him he was their landlord he was their kids principal he was their pastor they couldn't sneeze, except they were risking losing everything. And Sister Patsy came to me one day and she said, Chuck, I don't know what to do. My husband and I, we see what's going on here and it is so unholy, it is so ungodly, we don't know what to do. She said, Brother so I'm not going to give his name. He said, Brother so and uh, has told us that if we ever tried to expose him, that he'll take our kids' school records and burn them. 
And that way, if we try to put our kids in another school, they, they might have to go back a grade or something, you know, because they're not going to be able to know even where they're supposed to be and everything. And he's told us that he'll evict us and he'll say, oh, he just had people by the throat. And one day I had had a conversation with this young lady who was living there. And I met with her in private, I thought. And I, all I said to her was, honey, could I please suggest to you that you not run around dressed the way you dress? I said, it's really not a good idea, especially around the pastor and everything. All of a sudden, I'm getting called to the pastor's office, and he's letting me know, mind my own business. He's fine with the way she dresses and blah, 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 blah. Turns out that she let him know that I had asked to talk to her, and he was standing right outside the door when I had my conversation with her. I mean, it, it, it was just the most hideous mess you've ever seen. I told Sister Patsy, Sister, get your kids, pack your car, and run as fast and as hard as you can run. I said, whatever price you've got to pay, it'll be worth it to get out of this mess. It don't matter what you lose. It don't matter what. Mm -hmm. If your kids have to go back a grade, it'll be better than keeping them in this cult because it had become a cult. This man literally was having sexual relations with I don't know how many ladies in his church. Ongoing. It was just, it was, he had a harem. Well, I eventually was able to take my own advice to get out of there. I left there. I went back to Riverside. I went to Brother Gillum, and I, he was the, the, the district overseer for that area. And I said, Brother, Brother Gillum, I said, things are going on over there. He said, Chuck, I know. I know. He said, the Church of God is aware. He said, but that man's been ordained for 20 years or better. And he said, and you don't just yank somebody's ordination. The Word of God has specific guidelines for how these things are handled. And he said, but we've been watching him. He said, don't kid yourself. He said, when you said you wanted to go over there, he said, I didn't stop you because I knew you wanted to work for the world. Honestly, I wish Brother Gillen would have, but anyway... He said, I know you wanted to work for the Lord and all that. He said, but we need witnesses to these things. We have to have good, solid witnesses. He said, well, now you've seen. All right? Well, to make a long story short, a little while later, this man's wife left him. And she went straight to the Church of God headquarters, and she laid it all out plain as day what was happening. And they swooped in and they yanked his ordination and they booted him out and he stood there threatening the church of God. You'll sell me this building because I won't even let anybody come to church here. I own every house on this road and I'll blockade it. I mean, this man was out of his mind. When you stand around saying, oh, this one's a cult leader, that one's a Honey, I got news for you. I have been there, all right? I have seen it with my own eyes. I know what it is when a preacher goes bad. And sweetheart, this preacher don't even come within a billion miles of any of that. And when you can stand there and run around and let your mouth run, let your tongue loose, and make accusations against a man of God who is doing everything in his power to preach it true and live it right. God have mercy on your soul. God have mercy on your soul. Do you know how many people I told about what was going on at this church? Nobody. What my business? It does not bring glory to God for me to run around 
gossiping, even though I had first-hand knowledge of what was going on over there. I didn't, when I came back to Riverside, I didn't run around to everybody at Riverside, oh, do you know what's going on over there at Brother So-and-So's church? Well, let me tell you, uh-uh. No. Because, honey, if you can't bridle your tongue, my Bible said, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are pure, come on now, uh -huh. think on these things. Well, I got news for you. It also tells us, in, in, in a nutshell, that if you've got anything to say, it better be positive, it better be good, because life and death are in the power of the tongue. You don't run around living evil. I'm not going to say, why would I glorify the devil by telling everybody what he's doing over there? That's what you're doing. If it is an evil work, if it is, if the man is bad, if it, then you know what? According to the Word of God, you need to pray for him. That's right. And then you need to keep your big mouth shut. You don't be running around telling tales and, you know, leveling accusations. Because if you're right, God will take care of it. And the Lord did. And you know what? I didn't run around and tell nobody about what happened at that church while I was there. And just to give you an idea of what a horrific experience it was, because I believe me, tonight I hadn't even been able to convey to you what it was like. It was a really emotionally difficult experience. Uh, it was an extremely hard experience. One of the worst I've ever had in my life. When I went back to Connecticut several months later, I used to see a van drive up the road past our house, and I swore to God it was this man coming after me. And I had dreams about this man coming after me because he had threatened me. See, he knew I knew what was going on, and he had a little talk with me. At that point in my life, I had never so much as had an experience with a person of the same gender. I was suppressing and, you know, keeping my issues deeply suppressed. And I was living a celibate life. And this man, part of his threat to me was, if you ever tell anybody what you've seen here, I'll tell the church of God you're a homosexual. And you'll never preach in this organization so long as you live. Now, boy, if that wasn't Satan. Mm -hmm. See, the devil knew what issues I was dealing with. And when this man said that to me, I'm telling you, it horrified me. And this man threatened violence. He, he was crazy. Jack, I went for over a year having nightmares about him. I went for over a year... I swear to God, every time I'd see a van that looked anything like his van, I was terrified he was coming after me. I didn't know if he was going to try to shoot me. I didn't know what, because he was crazy. This man was crazy. He claimed that the Lord would bring his dead son down to their bedroom so he and his wife could hold him and visit with him every once in a while. They had a son who had died of leukemia or I forget what. And this man literally told me that Jesus would bring his dead son down and visit them in their bedroom and let them visit with their dead son and talk to their dead son. Honey, that man was so far off his rocker it wasn't even funny. I still, still, I'm only speaking of it tonight as an illustration, okay? I'm not mentioning his name, I'm not praying, even though it's all finished business, it's all old news, okay? How many times have you ever heard me talk about this, Jack? Okay? Uh-uh. It would serve no good purpose. If any man among you seemed to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widow 
in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. I got about 12 minutes and our Bible study tonight will have been roughly 90 minutes. This is good teaching. Two important things are said in this last portion in verse 27. Two very important things. Number one, he said, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. Visit the fatherless and the widow in their affliction. Help those that cannot help themselves. In biblical times, a widow, if she had no family to care for her, no sons or, uh, or nephews even or anybody to care for her, honey, she was as good as dead. And the same thing was true of orphans. The same thing was true of those that had no dad or, uh, or mom. And God is saying pure religion is to help those that are not able to help themselves. Not those who want to sit around lazily and do nothing. Amen. God's church is not obligated to help the lazy. God's church is not obligated to help those that have no ambition. God's church is not obligated to help people who will not help themselves. Amen. No. This specifically speaks of pure religion is helping those that need help that otherwise do not have it. And this preacher, y'all know me. I, I'm going to say this. I have a very, 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 very giving nature. I love to give. I, 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 I believe in generosity, and I don't believe generosity has a cap on it. That's right. I don't believe you can outgive God. Right. But that does not mean that I do not believe that there are some folk who try to take advantage of of people who are generous in nature, who don't want to help themselves, who don't want to do for themselves. They want to sit back and let the church pay the bills and, you know, and God has not placed that burden on us. Mm -hmm. Amen. That is not the burden of the church to care for those who just don't. The Word of God said, if you don't work, you don't eat. Now, I understand there are people on disability. I understand there are people, uh, you know, who struggle financially. I do understand this. But let me tell you something right now. I've said it before and I'll say it again. We've had people come to this church on disability, get more money than I did. And I was living on my own for eight years that I was living in Dallas. They get more money than I did, Jack. And yet... They still griping and complaining all the time they're broke, but they can afford to smoke cigarettes. Yeah. They come to church and every single service, I'm more than happy to buy them a burger after church. I'm more than happy to buy them a salad, well, you know, whatever, wherever we are. I don't have a problem with that. But they want the church to pay their bills. They want the church to pay their rent. They want the church to carry them. And I say, no, you get disability. And that is to pay your basic needs. That is to provide you with housing. That is to provide you with uh, food. There's a reason why you get this. Okay, We are not obligated to support people who will not do for themselves. That's a Amen. fact. Amen. I understand more and more every day why the Salvation Army approaches things the way they do. There was a time in my life when I questioned whether the Salvation Army was doing right because when somebody goes to them for help, you know, they got to, you got to give them half your life story. Well, you know what? I've come to realize why they have to do that. I've come to understand why they have to do that. Because otherwise, you're going to get people that could easily take care of themselves, but they want to squander away their money. They want to squander away what they get, the resources they have, and just let the Salvation Army pay their bills. 
So therefore, the Salvation Army says, how much money do you get in? What is your light bill? What is your rent? How much do you spend on groceries, right? You go for food stamps, they do the same thing. You go for welfare, they do the same thing. There's a reason, because there's a lot of people out there that are unscrupulous, who will turn around and lie like a rug so that they can get as much help from everybody as possible so they can live high on the hog. The church is not under any obligation to support people that will not take care of themselves. But we absolutely are under an obligation to care for those that need help. Amen. And this preacher, as you all know, has absolutely no problem with that concept at all. I don't mind helping people that need help. Honey, That it's my joy. You cannot outgive God. Give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaking together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. I'm telling you, when you reach out and, and, and with a spirit of generosity and give without thought, God without fail gives back. Yes, he does. You, God will never let anybody owe him nothing. You ain't never gonna, you ain't never gonna have God indebted to you. That's right. He pays his debts. Uh -huh. And so when we reach out and bless, and y'all know I believe that way, and I practice that, I live that. So anyhow, that's part one of this. But here's the other part that I love in the holiness church. Yes. I love how they twist it. How they represent it in the way they want to represent it. And they miss some of the most important truths that you could ever touch upon. The second obligation of pure religion is to keep himself unspotted from the world. This does not mean that in the year 2012 you're supposed to run around dressing like you're from Little House on the Prairie. That is not keeping yourself unspotted from the world. That is not keeping yourself. Honey, I know people that dress like Laura Ingalls. Uh -huh. Preach it. And they are more worldly uh -huh. in their mind and in their thinking than the worldliest TV preacher personality you've ever seen. The world is what determines people's mindsets. The world is what determines how people think and how people approach things. The world has a carnal way of looking at things and viewing things and doing things. And too many so-called holiness people have a worldly mindset and a worldly way of doing things and a worldly way of seeing things. And they are by, by a long shot not keeping themselves unspotted from the world. Keeping yourself unspotted from the world means that you have a mind like Christ. Uh -huh. I told you I have a family member that I love and I think the world of her. I really do. She's UPC. Piles her hair up on her head. Always just perfectly every little hair in place. You know, goes to the hairdresser every week, gets everything just perfect. Her husband, my uncle, did very well for himself in this life. Very well for himself. Became very wealthy and very successful. And this lady wears, honey, the prettiest, nicest, highest end clothing. She drives the fanciest, prettiest Cadillac that they make. Oh no, them Cadillacs with all that chrome, that ain't good enough. I gotta have one that has the gold trim. Literally. And then sit there and brag about how this car gets, well, bless the Lord, you know, oh, this car just gets so much attention. So many people talk about my car and 
So many people compliment me on my car. This lady had carpeting installed in her family room one day. And I went in and visited and I saw the new carpeting. And it was beautiful. It's very nice carpeting. Beautiful color, everything. And she said, But you know, it's not the color I wanted. I really wanted just a little shade darker. And they brought this and... So, you know, I'm having them come back and they're tearing all this out and they're going to put in the color I wanted. Worldly. Worldly, 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 worldly. When you're living to keep up with the Joneses, when you're living to impress people, when it's all about keeping up appearances, when it's all about... Uh, 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 about trying to un undo the, ne the guy next door. Honey, that is carnality. That is worldliness. Amen. You are not keeping yourself unspotted from this world. Amen. I put clothes on my back and as long as I'm covered and look decent, I don't care if you like the label on it or not. I don't care if I bought it at Caldor or if I bought it at Macy's or if I bought it at Lord and Taylor. I'm not trying to impress you with my clothing. Uh -huh. But we got people call themselves holiness, Jack. Uh -huh. And their spirit is so carnal. We got churches today call themselves Pentecostal. Oh, dare I go there. Go there. And their worship service sounds like a rock concert. Mm -hmm. The music that comes from their platform is so carnal and so worldly. You can't hardly distinguish it from what you'd hear in a nightclub or in a bar room or in a honky-tonk. Mm -hmm. If there's anything disgusts the, the fire out of me is hearing a Jesus name church. And I see it all the time. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for the garbage that comes out of UPC Bible colleges today. You can take it all and burn it. It is, every ounce of it is straight from hell. I have not heard one recording out of a UPC Bible college in the last 10 years that doesn't sound so bloody carnal and worldly and disgusting. It makes me want to wretch. Uh -huh. Oh, but we're holiness. Oh, but we're representing God. Bless the Lord. We're separate from the world. You liar. Uh-huh. Liar! And you're deceiving only yourself. Your music sounds like the world. I'm going to tell you something. You ought to be able to walk past the church and hear music coming out of that building and know that it's gospel music. Uh -huh. There ought to be a clear distinction in the music that we hear in the house of God and the music that we hear in the world. Uh -huh. This mentality of, well, bless God, in order to win people, we've got to sound like they like to hear. We've got to create a sound. Baloney! My God, on the day of Pentecost, thousands were saved and nobody was playing the worldly music of the day. Man. If you get back to prayer, if you get back to preaching it true, if you get back to living it like you're preaching, honey, God would do the work. Yes, he would. When you think you've got to do yes, the work, then it's carnal. Uh -huh. And you've given yourself over to a worldly spirit when you think you've got to do it. Uh -huh. That whole true. mindset. Well, you know... We got to use modern music to reach the young people. Yes, carnality, worldliness. Your mindset is carnal, it's worldly. What you're basically saying is God cannot possibly reach people except that you stoop down to their level uh -huh. in order to win them. Uh -huh. That's what they're saying. 
And then these same fools will come out with, quote Paul, I've become all things to all men, that I might by some means win some. And I've heard that passage butchered to murder my entire life, and it disgusts me. Paul, by no means was Paul justifying, emulating worldly, carnal mindsets and attitudes and music and anything else. That is not what Paul was talking about. Right. Paul said, I identify with people where I can identify with them. To the Jew, I'm a Jew. To the Greek, well, I was born and raised in a Gentile environment, so to them I'm able to say, I understand your world. I understand where you're coming from. That's what Paul was saying. If you're a cancer survivor, then you're able to identify with other cancer survivors. If you're a former alcoholic, then you're able to identify with former alcoholics. If you're a former drug addict, then you're able to identify with former drug addicts. That's what Paul meant when he said, I've become all things to all men. He said, every area of my life where I can identify with people, I identify with them where they're at. Uh -huh. But he by no means was saying that it's acceptable to adopt carnal mindsets and acceptable to adopt carnal ways of doing things in order to achieve a quote unquote godly end. The end does not justify the means in the kingdom of God. Amen. There are two ways of doing things in the kingdom of God. There's God's way and there is the wrong way. That's it. End of the story. There's no middle ground. Thank you, Lord. This movement has never been more powerless than it is today. Mm -hmm. But our churches are bigger than they've ever been. Uh -huh. Why? Because we've adopted carnal, worldly ideas. We've adopted carnal ways of doing things. All people can't stand this preacher because of the way I do things. They don't like the way this preacher approaches things. Well, you know why? Because you're so used to preachers that are doing everything carnal and worldly. And when somebody comes along and says, I'm going to do it God's way or no way, you don't know what to do with it. Uh-huh. That's right. But I'll tell you what, when it's all said and done, you just wait and see. You wait and see. When God's finished with this work and He's done what He's... Hit, where he, when He's taken us where He's trying to take us... <laughs> You watch and see. All them carnal folk thought they were so slick, you know, stooping down to the world's level in order to quote unquote win people. You don't win people, honey. You might get people coming to church, but you got a bunch of carnal, unsafe people. That's right. People that are hearers but not doers. And if the preacher in the pulpit's deceived himself into thinking that they're all saved, then bless his heart. But I'll tell you what, you're not fooling God. Uh -huh. And we better get back to old time religion. Amen. We better get back to the old tested paths. We better get back to the old worn ways, man. Because they worked then and they'll work today. Uh-huh. They, they never stopped working. They didn't never stop working. When I was a kid, Jack, we didn't have Christian rock. We didn't have Christian nope. uh, uh, rap. We didn't nope. have all this mess. But boy, I'm going to tell you what we did have. We have the power of God. I've seen our church grew and grew and grew by leaps and bounds. We didn't even have a projector to put the words on the wall. Every song we sung, Tommy, was by memory. Every uh -huh. single chorus we sang, uh -huh. and we sang out of the hymn note, we didn't have any projectors. We didn't right. have any electric guitars. That's we right. didn't have any drums. But we had the power of God. Uh -huh. And God. God did important. the work. Amen. Most important. And when you think you've got to do it or you've got a, a smart way of doing it, honey, you are not operating in the realms of faith. Mm. And without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Amen. When you think you can do it because God can't, 
then you are not operating in the realms of faith. So tonight, I believe we have finished the first chapter. Hallelujah. It's all about living this thing, not yes. just hearing it. It's about doing this thing, not just talking it. Amen. We've got to put into practice what we hear if we want to be blessed in our deeds. I've told people a million times, people think I preach tithing because I'm, you know, I guess they figure out, I think I'm going to get rich and run off to Barbados or something. But I've been preaching this a long time. You know why? Because I know if people will do it, God will bless them. I've seen uh -huh. it my entire life. I've seen yes. it. My grandparents were an ideal example of people who were blessed their entire lives because they tithed. I don't, I'm not preaching this for my benefit. I'm preaching it for yours. Uh -huh. I don't tell folk you need to tithe because it's, it's, it, 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 it's doing something for me. I'm trying to tell you, if you'll do this, you'll see God do something for you. Uh -huh. If you'll be a doer, not a hearer only, the Word of God said, James chapter 1, that man will be blessed in his, in his deed. Hallelujah. Would you stand with us tonight?